Um, so actually taking stuff that we know already and have already and, and repurposing it for, for new new problems. And that, that requires not just taking the bounding boxes, but also maybe you know amending that bounding box with additional information. Data is treated as the dirty little secret of AI. When it makes headlines, it's usually for a bad reason. I'm Jennifer Ding from Encord. I'm a data scientist, data steward, and even a data festival organizer. I'm into data and I think we should talk about it more. That is what AI Data Chats is for. In today's AI Data Chat, we are here with Fred, Machine Learning Lead at Encord. Welcome, Fred. What is our AI data topic for today, and what have you chosen to pair it with? Thank you. Thank you for the, the warm welcome. Today's topic is going to be about mixing data and data modalities. I think that's that's one of the most uh, interesting and most powerful things I've seen in the AI or machine learning space uh, recently. And the, the thing I'm pairing it with is my, my Encore uh, cup. Or mark and it's it's filled with very like black coffee, dark as, as the night. Yeah. What a great topic and a great drink to have with it. So to start today's chat, we'll invite you to give a 60 second AI data hot take on your topic of choice. So please go ahead. Yeah. So we've seen a lot of stuff happening for uh, LLMs. They have you know recently you know, evolved into uh, Multimodal LLMs, where you can also show them videos and audio and, and documents and whatnot. And more recently, we actually also saw them be able to comprehend stuff like, um, you know, more traditional annotations and not only just comprehend them, but also actually speak them in the sense that they can also now produce bit masks, they can produce bounding boxes, they can produce answers to questions, all within the same model. And I think that's one of the most fundamental uh, sort of changes or shifts I've seen recently. And that's going to be the topic of uh, what we're going to talk about today. Wonderful. Thank you for that hot take. Um, a lot of questions coming to my mind already. I think the first thing that jumps to mind is that multimodal as a term, just like AI, means something different for everyone. Maybe depending on the mode you started with, like for LLMs, multimodal is everything beyond text. So I'm wondering for you, what does multimodal mean? What are the modalities that you are excited about? Yeah, um, there are many, and obviously it depends a lot on the use case. But what I think, the, like the fundamental thing I think is so cool is that from LLMs, we have a very, very good basis of understanding the world and how humans think and communicate. And that can actually be extended into all sorts of problems. And I think that's the really the power of starting from LLMs and then adding a lot of other modalities. If you think about robotics, for instance, we have recently seen these things everyone call VLAs, which is vision language action models. So here the idea is that you take this LLM that has all this world knowledge already, you, you add in the visual component so it can see the world it's, it's operating in, and then you ask it to produce actions. And that's just one of these situations where multiple modalities actually give you a lot of degrees of freedom or a lot of advantages. Um, so it doesn't really matter what the modalities are. I just think that this idea about having a world, understanding of the world, and then be able to sort of attach more information to, to get more clever outputs. I think that's, that's the key. It definitely is leagues beyond what we used to do in annotation in the olden days of AI, where it was, you know, drawing bounding boxes on cats and dogs or hot dog, no hot dog to name a popular classification problem. I guess now that we're going into this multimodal world where we're capturing more of the world, going beyond the screen and into um, a, a wider understanding um, of our surroundings, what kinds of annotations have you noticed these days in the multimodal world, perhaps in robotics or combining different modalities? Yeah, um, if we start with robotics, I think one particularly interesting thing here is, is actually the, the opposite of what you just said, going into the real world. So they're actually taking things into simulation instead, right? They are building an entire 3D world within the computer, and then they can simulate robots actually operating in that simulation. And they can actually get really, really far. They can do reinforcement learning and all sorts of things. And they don't even need to label anything. The labels are sort of implicit in the system. And then the real problem comes when they need to take this robot from the synthetic or virtual environment and then into the real production use case. Then it becomes tricky because then you need actual true data and, and true labels. And then the labels are not just you know bounding boxes around things. 
it's you know bounding boxes around things across time attached to actions and what is supposed to be the trajectory of this thing or what is going to be the motion of this arm and so it becomes much more complex and you need to be able to also as a human when you are sort of assisting the models see more context than just a video or just um just text um, yeah. as you're exploring what annotations look like in these new worlds are there any interesting annotations that you yourself have made recently that jumped to mind yes implicitly again i think one of the keys for really advancing the field is that we are continuously you know stepping up another set of shoulders of hard work that has been done already um, so one of the things and the reason why i sort of brought up this topic in the first place was that this machine learning team from google they figured out a way to take llms and then take all the data we have already for bounding boxes and for bit mass across the entire open source uh, data market and then actually make it a part of the training um, and, and, and we're doing similar things and um, so actually taking stuff that we know already and have already and, and repurposing it for, for new new problems and that that requires not just taking the bounding boxes but also maybe you know amending that bounding box with additional information like queries what like instructions what do you want the model to do or it could be questions based on on these information um, that sounds brilliant. All the billions of annotations that have already been made across image and text modalities, which were the starting point of so, so much AI exploration, the fact that we can reuse them and repurpose them sounds brilliant. And in this space of millions and billions of annotations, out of curiosity in your career, since you've been in AI for quite a while, do you have a sense for the annotation you've made the most of? I know for me, it's definitely parking spaces or cars. I think I've, I'm probably in the hundreds of thousands for making annotations on those objects. That's, that's a really good question. So to be honest, I hate making annotations. So I spend as much time as I can and try to be as clever as I can to actually avoid it and, and find ways around it. So how can I bootstrap these problems? How can I, you know, as I said, take stuff that's already labeled or how can I employ some models that I might already have or something else to just, you know, avoid labeling and then maybe just switch the task to, to accepting or rejecting because that's much easier and much, much faster. So I've been accepting and rejecting a lot and a lot of data. Yeah, that kind of human in the loop process definitely sounds like a smarter direction for where annotation is heading, where at this point we've probably made enough manual annotations and we're exploring what's possible with maybe AI assisted annotations or agentic workflows. So on this topic, AI agents has been um, all over the place lately. And I know in a lot of your work, you are looking into things like data agents or agents that can assist AI data workflows. So how do you see these kinds of agents that might support annotation or context enrichment fitting into the agentic AI picture? Yeah, um, there's, I think there's a distinction we have to make, make here. One problem is building a particular model with, with a particular data set that has particular properties. And that's typically what I think data agents are for. So how can you have some sort of automation that helps you through that process, get through that process faster. And then there's, there's this sort of other category of problems, which is actual agentic applications, I would say, where you, you have LLMs that can maybe reason and they can perform tasks on, on your behalf that are maybe less constrained than what you would need for, a, for building a particular data set to solve a particular problem. So there's like this distinction, first of all, I think we need to make. And of course, some of this stuff from, from over here where you have agents working autonomously on, on things, it can so, somehow leak into these data agents where you can have them you know, prioritize things or route things or pull in the right information with you know, tools or rec systems or whatever to actually make the right call. So they can definitely assist, but, but they're not necessarily a main component. And so, so what I really care about is these data agents. And, and the reason why I care about that is because we have seen them succeed so many times. If you, if you look into how DeepSeek R1, for instance, was built, the, and you actually, you actually, your intro was actually really, really good in the sense that you said data can be quite boring, but it's typically the, you, you know, your secret source or, or the thing that, that sets you apart from everyone else. And, and DeepSeek, the DeepSeek team did it really, really cleverly by iterating back and forth between having a, a model that was quite good at reasoning and then producing reason, reasoning trajectories from that model 
and it had some sort of shortcoming. And then they would go over here for all the data that's synthetically generated and then fix it, maybe with humans, maybe with some other deterministic uh, you know, functions, data agents, essentially. Then they would go back and train a new model and it would have a list of these sort of bad properties. And then they would do that actually four times before they reach deep seek R1. And I think that's that's really the power. And we have seen it there. We have seen it for Sam. And I'm sure we have seen, like, even though we don't hear about OpenAI, I'm sure they do the same thing. People are even training models of, of uh, OpenAI, right? Just data generated from, from these kind of sources. So that's that's really what, what I think is really interesting and, and extremely powerful. So out of curiosity, now that we have all these tools and whether they're agentic workflows or specific AI models that are built for something like segmentation, like SAM2, do you think we are headed towards a post manual annotation world? Um, where, what is the future of annotation? That's, that's a really good question as well. And it's one I've been thinking of quite a lot, actually, to be honest. And I, don't think it'll ever go away. Um, the reason for that, but I think I think the, the, it, it'll shift to another purpose, essentially. So usually it would be humans annotating to teach a model something. And these days, humans are annotating much, much less, and we're doing much more pre-training in order to just get like a, a basis for, for what we want our models to do. And then we will have less data that is carefully curated and annotated by humans. And that, that portion will probably be smaller and smaller. So in that sense, I think human annotation will decline. However, there will always be this big alignment problem where you want to make sure that the model is doing what you want it to do. And there's this big research area around uh, you know, LLM eval and every other of these sort of big complex model eval where you don't have, it's hard to deterministically tell how good the model is. And in all these situations, you will have to employ humans somehow um, to just make sure that it does what you want it to do. Um, you cannot do that without having humans, I think, to some extent. Really interesting. In a way, it seems like we are starting to see what's next in the evolution of what human and AI interaction looks like for learning or alignment. So I think that is a great question for us to end on. And we'll move into the final section of this, which is rapid fire five questions that we will ask at the end of every chat. You ready? Rex, I am. <laughs> All right. Maybe one more sip of that black coffee. Okay, first question for you. What scale of data are you working with these days? Yeah, hundreds of thousands of, of data points at the moment. Any favorite data sets you've come across recently? I guess my own, not, uh, not, not something at the top of my head now. What do you think is an AI data challenge that should be receiving more attention? how you repurpose or cast problems in low data regimes such that they can be solved by machine learning. I think it's a really hard problem and yeah, needs a lot of attention. What do you think 2025 will be the year of for AI data? For AI data, I think robotics will definitely have a big search for uh, moving forward. And the other thing is probably biology. Um, yeah. Final question to close out the chat. How was your pairing of your drink with today's data topic? It was amazing. I love black coffee and I had a really good conversation. So where can we find more of your work? Yeah, um, go to uncourt.com slash blog, for instance, there you can see a lot of the stuff we are working on, or we even have a an open source repo for these data agents you can check out as well. You'll find it on Uncourt's web page as well. Thanks, Fred. So that wraps up this AI data chat. You can find links to our speaker's work in our episode description. If you'd like to share your thoughts or suggest a speaker, email us at aidatachats at uncourt.com.